Well, welcome everybody to what is episode 12 of Level Up, our weekly Q&A show where your questions drive the whole conversation. If you're watching on LinkedIn or on YouTube, you're very welcome, but please do follow the links in the chat if you'd like to engage with our panel. Um, that will take you over to Slido, which is where you really get to drive the show by voting up the questions that you would most like answered and also by, of course, adding your own first half of the show? Well, that's really all about general Q&A and the theme of this particular episode is all about public-private partnerships. So you can ask pretty much anything that you would like relating to that. In the second half, we're going to choose a topic where we want to spend a little bit more time. And today that's all about service-led PPPs, what makes them a little bit different and how we need to really think about how to construct them and how to execute them. So let's meet our panel for today. We're going to jump straight in and uh, joining us from India is Abaya Agawal, who is a partner of EY in India, and he's been working on transaction structuring and strategy for many years. So welcome, Abaya. Great to see you. Hi, Abaya. We can't hear you. Okay, so we'll come back to a buyer in a few moments. Um, from Melbourne, Australia, we also have Richard Foster, who has direct experience of both sides of the PPP equation, having worked in state government for many years and also in the private sector. So hi, Richard, welcome. Thank you, Nick. Really looking forward to answering some questions today and sharing a bit of expertise, both uh, from an Australian perspective and also what happens around the world. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. Um, Andre Kruger is based in South Africa and is the CEO of PPP Training Online. And they deliver both professional education and consulting services into the PPP space. Um, great to welcome you today, Andre. How are you? Well, thank you, Nick. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity and we look forward to engage with our colleagues online today. Thank you. Okay, excellent. All right, very good. Um, jumping across now to Malaysia, we welcome back Jan Willem Middelberg. He's the CEO of Cybient, whose growing presence in Asia is delivering extreme value in PPP training and consulting to clients right across the, the region. So uh, welcome, Jan Willem. And we're having a little bit of a challenge at the moment connecting with um, Jan Vellum. Mark Williams is in the UK. Um, Mark leads Grant Thornton's work on um, things like PPP, PFI efficiencies and expiry and that kind of thing. So he's been working in advisory for a very long time now. Uh, hi, Mark. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks, Nick. Yes, it feels like a very long time. So I've got a couple of decades <laughs> experience around PPPs. PFIs and in the UK, as Nick alludes to, we're seeing some of the early deals come to an end. So, you know, looking at those uh, PFI expiries. Um, I also do a significant amount of training. So I was involved in the development of CP3P and I've trained that uh, around the world and I train uh, Treasury's uh, better business case approach as well, which I think dovetails well and delighted uh, for the opportunity to present today. Okay, brilliant. Well, um, it's really good to see you again. Thank you very much um, for joining. Abaya, I'm, I'm hoping that we can now hear you. So would you like to just introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, we can't hear you, Abaya, unfortunately. Okay. So we'll come back to Abaya in, in a few moments. Um, completing our panel um, for today is uh, Charlotte. She's in the role of Question Master. So we'll um, introduce um, Charlotte to everybody. She's joining from Thames Valley in the UK. And um, so Charlotte, can we have the first question, please? You certainly can, Nick, and welcome everybody. We have a question from Martha in Edinburgh in the UK. What makes an outstanding PPP project bid and why? Okay, so what would you say would make an outstanding bid? Uh, Richard, do you want to kick us off on this one? 
Yes, thank you, Nick. Um, having been on government side evaluating bids for various PPPs, some of the lessons I've learned that I think the private sector when bidding for PPP projects can pick up are uh, that you really do need to make sure you fully understand what it is that government is asking for. Um, sometimes what we see is bidders will get the bidding documents, they'll put their interpretation on what it is that government is asking for, but they really don't take the steps they need to take to find out is their understanding of what's, what government is asking for actually correct and then they submit their bids and they're surprised to find that their bids get evaluated with relatively low scores. So my advice to anyone who wants to develop an outstanding PPP project bid would be make use of every opportunity you have to communicate with the government and understand what it is they really want why have their um, evaluation criteria been crafted the way they are? And also try and understand whether what you are developing as your bid really does address those requirements. Unfortunately, sometimes we see that bidders will have experience from other projects in other countries, and they'll think that the government on the project they're bidding for wants exactly what, what the government in the other project wanted. Not always the case. So really use every opportunity to understand, interact with the government, learn what they're asking for, and then really think about have we crafted our bid to really address what it is that government wants. Okay, excellent advice there. Um, Mark, what would you add to that? So I guess take the opportunity to link it to my earlier comments around HM Treasury's better business case training, because of course in the UK and also many other parts of the world, it's the business case that will set out very clearly right at the start in terms of all the great things Richard describes. So I think the bidder being familiar with the business case underpinning uh, the project is is very helpful. Um, I also think you know some of the uh, best bids I've seen is where actually the private sector bring ideas, innovation. So, you know, maybe also involved in actually writing the business case in terms of how the, uh, the problem, the strategic imperative, the case for change is addressed. Yeah, I, I, and I think that's super important because there always needs to be some added value. It's really important, as Richard said, for you to seek clarification at every opportunity that you can so you really thoroughly understand the problem and then add your value in um, as well as you go along. Um, Jan Vellum, what are your thoughts? Well, what I wanted to add um, is that in my opinion so done very well have been truly structured in a in a partnership fashion where there is a win-win relationship from both sides and the other the opposite is also true where we've seen ppvs go wrong is if it's either or so it's it becomes like um the the, the private sector against the public sector or vice versa so what, I, what I've uh, always um, uh, advised is in those very early stages is try to see if you can really get towards that partnership stage. What is the objective of both sides? And as soon as there's clear alignment and you can really truly create a win-win situation, that's where you start to see this work out in the long run. Yeah, and I, and I think certainly from you know my days in the software industry when I was involved in in bid teams, quite complex bid teams, um, you do need to be re reminded all of the time as a bid team about what those objectives truly are in that partnership. If you're not very careful, you can end up with a little bit of tunnel vision, you, you know, of of packing every you know part of your solution in into you know into the answer and it's not always necessarily the right way to do it sometimes less can be 
more in that situation. And um, Richard, I don't think it, it conflicts with you know any procurement rules to be able to go back to government to seek that clarification that you were speaking about earlier. You know, so long as you do it in in the proper manner, is is that a fair comment? I would say that generally a a sensible set of procurement rules for PPPs should be um, structured to provide that opportunity. Um, I, I guess I wouldn't say for certain that every PPP framework around the world does that, but if I was designing a PPP framework, then I'd certainly be looking at the procurement rules and making sure they're are those opportunities for clarifications and there are those opportunities for government to communicate with bidders more than just issuing a set of tender documents, but being able to do things such as present to bidders on government's vision for the project, um, conduct site visits, all those sort of things that will give bidders that deeper understanding of what it is government's asking for. Yeah, yeah. No, I, t I totally agree with that. And I, I have seen some really great examples of that, of how procurement teams have actually put together opportunities to host one to many, you know, briefing sessions and, you know, have really expanded on, you know, the written word to bring to life as you say, that, that kind of vision, really, of what government is looking for. Um, a buyer welcome back. I think we now have you <laughs> kind of linked back up with us. So, um, so it's, yeah. it's great to see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah can you hear yeah. me? So, so well, welcome. We can indeed, yeah. Thank do you. Want you. To just introduce yourself uh, so that everybody knows who you are and the work that you do. Yeah, so Abhay Agarwal, partner with Ernst & Young, Delhi, India. Uh, working in this sector um, almost for last 30 years. Um, fortunate to be involved in some service PPPs also. Yeah, so what I am seeing in India and from emerging market perspective is that, you know, the number of people who are interested, investors who are interested is kind of dwindling over a period of time. So while you make a great business case and also you have good dialogue process, I think reaching out is becoming more and more important to get people interested. And then, uh, you know, without flouting rules of procurement, et cetera, and I think you have to sit down with them. We just sold a PPP, Greenfield PPP port project. It was, I think, till last, we had to convince each of the bidder that it's a good business case. So it's just not business case, also convincing it's a good business case. So that makes a project really interesting and successful. Yeah, totally agree. Thank you. And uh, thank you for bearing with us with the connection issues that we're the, we are having today. So brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, panels. Charlotte, can we take the next question, please? We can, Nick. So we've got a question from Carl in Liverpool in the UK. Why does the public sector always bear the most risk? Okay, all right. Well, I think that I think that's a matter of perception. Um, uh, <laughs> so, Richard, we'll start with you, and then uh, we'll come to Mark next. Okay, go ahead. It's a good comment, Nick. That um, partly it's a matter of perception, and I think it also depends upon what we are talking about when we talk about risk. If we take a step back. We need to recognise that public-private partnerships come about because there is a reason for government to be pursuing the project. And that generally means that the project is addressing a market failure or it is delivering a, a public good or it is dealing with a natural monopoly type situation. There is some sort of reason why the project is something that shouldn't just be left to the private sector, but government needs to be driving the project. And so in that situation, it's generally natural that much of the risk, whether the project's a PPP or not, much of the risk will be with government. What we do in PPPs though, is there are specific sets of risks that we transfer to the private sector. 
and we often talk about risk transfer without really digging into what we mean by transferring risks. And it's not that the public sector is transferring the risk in a sense that the public sector no longer has to worry about it. What we're typically doing in a PPP contract is we are transferring the financial or the commercial consequences of the risk to the private sector because we expect the private sector will be in a better position to manage that risk. But there is always a residual risk with the government because it's a government project. If the project is delivered late, then the financial consequences may fall to the private sector partner. But for the government, there is still the issue that the infrastructure has been delivered late. So the government will always wear that residual risk. Okay. So that, that's one um, answer um, to the question of why the public sector always bears the most risk. We could get into detail then about how things play out in practice, but I think I should let the others um, okay. have their say. At this it will point. hold. Yeah, we may well come back to that um, in a little while, but I, I know Mark wants to jump in and then we'll go to Abaya and uh, Jan Vellum also. So um, Mark, Mark, go ahead. Great, thanks. So I suppose building on what Richard was saying, I mean, generally, uh, you know, PPPs, PFIs, they're about delivering essential public services. You know, those risks are there regardless. And ultimately, if it's essential public services, the public sector is going to bear the uh, backstop risk. Um, but my view remains, you know, having looked uh, in terms of setup and now sort of efficiency and expiry at the 700 PFIs we have uh, in the UK, which is a subset of PPPs, that it's uh, a bell-shaped distribution with some that have gone uh, not so great for the public sector, some that have gone not so great for the private sector, and there's plenty of instances of deals going wrong for the private sector and the private sector sort of falling over and then a, a rump in the middle that are doing broadly what was intended. So I, I see it as a, a bell-shaped distribution if you look across the 700 deals we've got. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It's very useful having that, you know, kind of um, empirical research-based view as well to be able to, to inform. Um, Abaya and then Jan Willem. Yeah, I think my perspective is that government in any case has to do project and if they are doing on its own through EPC they will be taking all the risk then what government is doing is taking out one by one performance risk operations risk sometimes construction risk commissioning risk to private sector so that they can manage it well I think then government have to look back that what is left and how do we manage that so be it contingency liability all of that I think there is way government can manage it better and that's why they take it. So it's not that government takes all the risk and wherever government takes all the risk and that is the kind of structure, I think projects do fail. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jan Willem. Yeah, the only, the only thing I wanted to add because I think most has been said around this uh, by, the, by the others already is um, government frequently has the strongest shoulders. So if you're getting into a situation in which you're just transferring too much risk towards the private sector, you'll all ultimately end up okay. that they're just going to pull out. Yeah, thank you. We we missed a little bit of that, but I think you're right. I think the it's all to do with the um, horizons, really, and and time plays into this really, really importantly. There are elements of these projects which can be packaged, which can be, you know, um, uh, viewed um, as uh, a portfolio of risks which can be managed appropriately either in the public or in the um, private sector, and so when that happens you start to get that um, distribution that works favorably for both sides of the equation. When, when you have an imbalance, of course, um, then you can see it happening in front of you, and particularly uh, those um, deals that were struck where perhaps people were a little bit too ambitious, you know, about the, the uptake of 
of a new service or um, a new transport infrastructure and these kinds of things where the, the revenue generation was a big part of the, the business case. But that, I think, is, is more of a reflection on you know, how we plan and forecast. And planning and forecasting is quite a tricky thing you know, to be able to do. But uh, generally around the world, um, people are getting... People are getting better at it. The more, the more that happens, the more use cases that there are and the more lessons that can indeed be learned. So great question, Carl. Thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you, panel, uh, for your thoughts on that. Let's move on. Um, Charlotte, can we take the next question, please? We can, Nick. We've got a question that's just come in, um, and it's from Marizo. Um, is it a PPP example or case in a fishing port, is it possible to manage with a general port? Okay, um, a buyer. I think what happens in a fin uh, fishing port, and we have many in India, is that you have a lot of local community coming and fishing there. And also they need a little different ecosystem versus normal general port. So it is always better that, uh, you know, create a different fishing port where local community can come and then evacuate fast instead of choking the yard and uh, rest of the general port services. Yes, yeah, certainly. The, and yes, the in terms of integration. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was about to in say terms that of PPP the whole integration part, of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so sorry, um, Abaya. So the, the whole integration of logistics for moving, um, you know, fresh goods and particularly, you know, landed fish, you know, at dockside, you know, to get those to market rapidly. And the thought around uh, the infrastructure required for a refrigerated um, supply chain from end to end is really, really critical. And I know that this is a, a fascinating area for, and it's being developed in many countries at the moment to kind of look at extending those you know, end-to-end -end refrigerated supply chains. And it could well be an area of great expansion coming up in the future. And uh, Abai, are you going to add from the, specifically from the PPP perspective? Um, yeah, so, so, so please do. in terms in terms of PPP, normally, you know, creating the port itself, infrastructure, that is something because it requires, uh, you know, the requirement of similar experience of building port, capital dredging, etc. And depending upon the location, whether next to existing port, you need certain expertise. So it is almost uh, certain that it has to be done through PPP and maybe the port itself could be a performance-based contract. Uh, and then it can be a PPP in terms of also where some of the services can be added, which is really required for the fishermen or the fishing boats, or as you mentioned, the cold chain infrastructure, etc., which can be integrated into the port itself. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Richard? Yes, just a quick comment. I think um, Abaya's an answer really clarifies in my mind um, the suitability of these sorts of projects. And I think with his initial comments about um, the nature of a fishing port, it reinforces in my mind, one of the key considerations in deciding whether a project is a PPP or not, um, which in some cases is what's the complexity of the stakeholder groups that you have to deal with? And um, what is the best way of um, dealing with those stakeholder groups. And sometimes it does mean that in order to best manage and communicate with stakeholders, PPP perhaps is not the optimal approach. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mark, anything to add? No, I'm not sure on this one. I necessarily do apologies. I've not come across uh, too many PPP port examples, uh, quite a few ports. Uh, I've seen a, a sort of private sector owned already. Yeah, understand. Thank you very much. But great question. And thank you very much for um, uh, sub submitting it. Um, Andre, you had something that you wanted to, to add to that. Yeah, may, maybe not specifically uh, referring to the uh, to the fishing port it, 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 uh, concept itself, but just maybe from from the South African perspective, we now find that uh, our government or 
government departments own some some port smaller port operations along alongside our coastline and they haven't been managing it very well so they are only now starting to consider making use of of, of ppp models to to upgrade because the the biggest problem currently for government is not having sufficient capital to upgrade these ports especially the capital works but then interestingly um, the, the 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 value the monetary value of these upgrade of, of these upgradings required is not not very large so we have suggested up to now that maybe we group some of these projects together uh, to make it to make it viable uh, but it's more uh, general ports even although they do have uh, a fishing uh, component uh, it's general uh, 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 fishing recreational etc et so it, it's a new area for for us so maybe we will learn from uh, apaya uh, from what they have done uh, in india uh, yeah, thanks yeah 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 it's it's quite possible i think you're right the deal size you know becomes increasingly important and it, it's quite interesting that organizations that have been used to you know acting you know as the prime in ppps you know set certain thresholds and so some of these projects may be viable but on their own you know they just may be a little bit too small in order to be able to attract you know the kind of um organizations that would typically take on these things if only they were larger so that concept of working collegiately and kind of bracketing different work together may may well be the solution and um, i do want to move on a buyer if that's okay um so we can take one more question before we get into our focus topic so um charlotte next question please thank you nick we've got a question from Haley in cambria australia how can we manage and minimize risk in PPPs? Okay, so more of a general question this time around managing and minimizing um, risk. Uh, go ahead, Mark. So for me, you know, risk is obviously uh, fundamental to uh, PPP arrangements. You know, you're uh, perhaps paying a bit more for any financing, but in return, you're transferring risk, hoping that innovation is brought, hoping that design, build, finance, operate, maintain is integrated, and also hoping that the uh, supply chain brings uh, due diligence. And I think it is that due diligence uh, in PPPs and PFIs that's very important to sort of call out, um, certainly in the UK historically. Um, we didn't even necessarily identify the risks up front. Government just charged forward and do the necessary. Um, whereas a PPP construct um, does force you through the work that you do up front to identify the risks. So at least you know what you're dealing with. And then once you know what you're dealing with, you can have that mature conversation around, you know, which party is best able to take the risk and also, you know, in true a uh, better business case fashion, you can build uh, monitoring, reporting, escalation frameworks around the risks that you've identified. Um, so I think, you know, never going to be easy to sort of manage and minimize the risks. The risks are always there. But I do think that using PPP rather than perhaps what we used to do in the UK uh, means that at least you're alert to the risks and you've uh, done some early due diligence to understand those risks. Yeah, agreed. It's definitely a journey rather than a destination. Uh, Jan Fellum? Well, one of the things that Mark is saying uh, is really striking, uh, striking with me is that it's, it's going to be impossible to minimize risk. The fact that there is risks in PPPs is just something that we always need to accept. From what I've seen is then how do we deal with risk management is that I, I kind of want to bring up the notion of, of contract management, because especially in um, uh, countries in Asia Pacific, from what we've seen is. Okay, so we've lost uh, Jan Willem for, uh, uh, for, for the moment. So we'll come, come back to um, him in a little while. Um, I think we do have one more question that's um, just come in from uh, folks watching live. So Charlotte, can we take that question, please? We can, Nick. And it's a question from Cherie. Um, can PPP be implemented into sports or tourism sectors? 
Okay, so is PPP the you know kind of mechanism that can be implemented into these um, sectors? What are what are your thoughts, panel? Um, Andre. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, and 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 very interesting sector. So let me start with tourism first, and let me start with uh, examples of um, uh, lodges in in game parks uh, in in Africa, not only in South Africa. Uh, many many game parks um, and the PPP concept. Uh, we, we we still call all of those concession type agreements because they are subject to market risk, subject to users. Uh, visiting the, these places. Um, it's been used quite extensively uh, on, on, on the continent and very successfully so. Uh, obviously, COVID had a big impact uh, on this. And in, in, in most of the cases, the uh, concessionaire had to take uh, the full risk um, of, of having less. Uh, they, they, they assumed 100% of the uh, patronage risk at, at the start of the contracts. So in the tourism sector, if I uh, just think about the uh, African uh, landscape with, with, with lots of game and, and nature resorts, it's being used very successfully. In sport, not so much. Um, and maybe our colleagues uh, in other parts of the world, uh, being a rugby follower, uh, we, we know that Stade de France in, uh, in, in France is a, a PPP stadium, uh, a major... Uh, infrastructure project and, and and maybe just to make the, the the comparison in south africa for the world cup a number of years ago the soccer world cup we developed stadiums but used a traditional procurement model and it's a major problem now uh, because uh, the stadiums were developed with uh, grant funding from government and then afterwards were uh, transferred very nicely to major municipalities that now sit with unfunded mandates <laughs> they've got to, they've got to now maintain right. these stadiums so uh, but then again it's a, it's a, a very complicated uh, sector on its own you need you need constant uh, occupation constant uh, sport or, or other music festivals whatever you want to <laughs> to, to make those projects work yeah. maybe I'll just stop there yeah indeed und und understand entirely um, Abaya, just really briefly and then we'll go on to the focus topic I think this question will also smoothly land us in the next uh, your focus sec uh, discussion. Uh, if you see sports, you have stadiums, but they are rarely used, and uh, you can make a lot of uh, you know sports academies. You can use them for other functions, including music functions, etc., and create additional revenue possibilities. The private sector can also market it well. I mean, particularly you know for cricket stadiums in India, for IPL, etc. If you know. Most of you are cricketing nations, so that's a pretty good uh, work which can be done there. In tourism, also besides resorts, etc., but I think there are a lot of destinations which are not very popular because they have not been popularized. So whole ecosystem of creating app, taking you through destination, ticketing, uh, resort booking, everything I think can be managed. The whole experience of a tourist to a destination can be increased by private sector. It can be a great service, led PPP. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. And that's a great segue then for us to change gears now and uh, move into our focus topic, which this week is being led by Richard Foster. So there are unique challenges associated with service-led PPPs as distinct from those focusing on infrastructure. And um, for this, we welcome back um, Richard. So uh, we'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, I was really pleased when I was asked to talk today about service-led PPPs because the term service-led PPP had an immediate clear meaning to me and one that I'm quite passionate about. But I thought before I prepare my presentation, I better just check that other people think of the same thing as, as I do when they hear the phrase service-led PPPs. And what I found interesting was, if you Google the term service-led PPPs, you'll actually find it's not a widely used term. And there is no settled meaning of what we are talking about when we're talking about service-led PPPs. So let's think about 
what we might mean. Imagine a railway station. Now, many of us who work in PPPs, we tend to be very focused on infrastructure. So when we think of a railway station, we might think about the arrangement of the tracks and the platforms. We might think about um, the structure of the station. Is it going to have a roof over the platforms? If so, if it's a major railway station in a major city, then perhaps we might want a very spectacular roof, make the station itself a, a iconic building of the city. But for users of the railway station, what's important is the service that the railway station provides. So really, infrastructure is an enabler for services, and it's the services that are provided that are important to users or to citizens. It's not the infrastructure, the physical facility in itself that's important. It's the services that it provides. So the question then becomes, how can we ensure that we are providing the right services with our infrastructure? And in particular, how can we use PPPs to provide not just good infrastructure, but good services? Well, one approach that some governments take with some infrastructure is for the government to provide the infrastructure itself and then use a service contract to contract a private partner to operate the infrastructure under a performance-based contract to provide the service. So when I go to my local railway station, which is only a short walk away, the railway station is an existing railway station owned by the government. The train I catch is a train that has been procured by the government. But the government has then contracted out to the private sector the operation of the system. So the operation of the stations, the operation of the trains, and the private partner does that under a performance-based contract. Under that contract, there are some good incentives for the private partner to provide a good level of service. But one of the challenges they face is that the service they provide is constrained by the infrastructure that the government has provided to them. So while this type of service contract, it it might be regarded as a PPP under some definitions of a PPP, but it is not a type of PPP that really delivers the best service outcome by making sure that the infrastructure underlying the services is the best infrastructure for delivering the service and the service itself is the best service that can be achieved. Another approach we see with some infrastructure is what we call a design, build, finance and maintain PPP or a DBFM. Very widely used here in Australia for hospitals and in the UK for hospitals, used in many countries for schools, um, used in some countries for prisons um, and other types of infrastructure. So here the private partner provides the infrastructure under a PPP contract, but government operates the infrastructure to provide the service. Now, this can be very successful, particularly where the government is the um, entity that is best placed to provide the best level of service. And here in Melbourne, where I live, we have some fantastic hospitals that have been delivered under this PPP model and that deliver really good health services. But once again, here we have a separation of the infrastructure and the service. And here, in fact, the PPP is clearly not a service-led PPP because the PPP is really about the infrastructure, not the service. 
Many PPPs, though, are what we call design, build, finance, operate and maintain, or DBFOM PPPs. And these are PPPs where the private partner provides both the infrastructure and the service under a single PPP contract. So here we at least have the private sector responsible for the infrastructure, responsible for the service, and therefore in a position to provide the best outcomes for users and citizens. So this is quite a common model for toll road projects. And the sort of services that the private sector might provide in a toll road project include not only the fairly obvious service of operating the tolling system, whatever that may be, it might be cash toll booths where you pay your tolls in cash, it might be some sort of an electronic tolling system. But the private sector might also be responsible for other services, such as maintaining the grass median strips, maintaining the vegetation along the road. They might even be responsible for incident response on the toll road, where if you break down in your car on the toll road, they will come and assist you. Or if there um, is some cargo that falls off a truck onto the road, they are responsible for clearing the toll road um, of the debris. But a lot of DBFOM PPPs are not what I would call service-led PPPs because the focus is predominantly on the infrastructure itself and the services, the service that's provided is not really at the forefront of everyone's thinking. Often we approach DBFOM, DBFOM PPPs primarily thinking about delivering the infrastructure and then we regard the services as something that will just follow on as a consequence of that. So if we want true service-led PPPs, particularly in the case of these design, build, finance, operate and maintain PPPs, we actually need a change in our mindset. We need to move from thinking about designing and building the infrastructure as being the most important thing and then getting someone to operate and maintain it. Instead, we need to think about designing the service and then designing and building the necessary infrastructure to support that service. So what does that mean during the PPP life cycle? Well, it means we need to apply this change in mindset at each stage of the life cycle. And we need to apply this change in mindset on both the government side and on the private partners side. So if we start with the project identification at the very beginning of a project, we need to start by very clearly defining a service need and then always remembering that what we're seeking to do is to meet a service need of the public, not just deliver a piece of infrastructure. When we get to the project appraisal, therefore, we should be developing the project, um, building the detail of the project with a strong service focus. When we structure our PPP, we really need to focus on structuring a PPP around a very clear set of service requirements that are supported by infrastructure requirements. So we don't ignore the infrastructure. We may have quite detailed requirements that the infrastructure needs to meet, but our PPP contract should be primarily focused and driven by the service that is going to be delivered. And then in our tender process, we should be running a tender process that really drives the service outcome with service focused evaluation criteria. On the private sector's side, when the private sector is bidding for a service led PPP, 
a really important first step is to get the right structure of the private sector consortium bidding for the PPP. Around the world, we see a lot of PPP consortia that are really led by a construction contractor. The construction contractor leads the consortium, joins up with an operator, arranges some finance, but often the strongest party or the most influential party in the consortium is the construction contractor. Here in Australia, we have a slightly different history of PPPs. Here in Australia, we have tended to have financier-led consortia. So you would have um, a financier that would lead the consortium and they would bring in a construction contractor and an operations and maintenance contractor. But for a truly service-led PPP, you really need the operator to be leading the consortium and to have really strong influence in the consortium, not just kept to one side as being, well, the construction contractor will design the infrastructure, the financiers will finance it, and then once it's all done, we'll hand it over to you to operate. The operator needs to be really leading by defining how the service will be delivered, and then the construction contractor needs to design the infrastructure to support that service delivery. That means during the design and construction of the infrastructure, there should be very strong operator input and a very large focus on operational mobilization. And then once the construction is completed, obviously the operator should be there with a strong service focus delivering value for users and citizens. So that's a quick outline of what I see as service-led PPPs, and I really look forward to your questions. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Richard. Really, really interesting. And um, uh, I, I think, but you know, more and more, I kind of get this sense that you know, in in the past when commercial clarity has meant separation of roles you know so there's a clear start and an end to a contract there's a scope statement around a contract you know that's actually not helpful in these situations to the extent that you really do need you know an end-to-end -end, uh, view you know the end-to-end -end involvement the end-to-end -end ownership if you're actually going to deliver you know the value back to uh, you know back to citizens. So, really, really interesting. Thank you very much. And um, let's jump straight uh, into our questions, if we can do. So, Charlotte, um, what's the first focus topic question, please? So we have a question from Haley in Canberra. When should we? Sorry, when should we consider not using a PPP model? Okay, are there circumstances, Richard, where we should not use PPPs? Go to Richard first and then a buyer. Uh, there certainly are. In fact, what we see in most developed countries with mature PPP markets is that the percentage of government infrastructure spending um, that is done through PPPs is a relatively small percentage of the overall infrastructure program. Um, maybe 10 to 15% in some countries. In developing countries, often because of capability gaps, there is a stronger um, desire and greater scope to use the private sector through PPPs. The Asian Development Bank uh, did some analysis a few years ago and concluded that perhaps in developing countries, typically up to 35% of infrastructure spending might be done through PPPs. But those figures suggest that, in fact, the majority of infrastructure spending should not be done using PPPs. Why is that the case? Well, that's the case because not every project is suitable to be a PPP even though every type of project or every sector potentially is a sector in which you can do PPPs. So 
Right. What are the key things that would immediately make me think this project is not suitable to be a PPP? One would be we don't have a clearly defined set of outputs that are going to remain relatively stable over the long term. I was involved in a uh, water treatment project where the treated, treated wastewater was going to be provided to an industrial customer. That industrial customer was going to have changing requirements for the water. That would mean we wouldn't have a consistent output we required from the wastewater treatment plant. Therefore, it wasn't suitable to be a PPP. Uh, other reasons you might not consider doing a PPP. What if there is really no role for the private sector after construction is completed or no logical role? Um, there are projects like that where you might have an existing um, maintenance and operational regime and therefore construction of new infrastructure. It doesn't make sense to construct new infrastructure and then have it operated and maintained separately from a wider network. Understand. Risk transfer. Understand. Some some projects have risks that aren't suitable for transfer and there are other reasons but i'll stop there and give the others an opportunity okay. to, to share their thoughts yeah thanks very much indeed uh, abai go ahead yeah i will give a quick answer so this, this question has two part one is general ppp which is infrastructure ppp and one is because of our uh, focus is on service-led ppp so i will answer that in terms of infrastructure ppp if uh, if it is a whole gamut of things from construction to operation and uh, the contribution from the government is uh, highly significant i think it is better not to try ppp because there can be a gaming from private sector in construction cost itself and the abandonment risk may increase so that is one view and second thing in terms of i think uh, services ppp if there is no significant transfer of risk if there is no significant private sector appetite or expertise, uh, then uh, better to refrain from it, uh, maybe develop through a government-owned company, create some space and privatize it to start with, uh, rather than going for a very thin crowd of private investors. Okay, all right, thank you very much, Andre. Just wanted to make a quick comment about technology. And we all know technology is uh, developing fast, uh, quite a significant risk. Initial wisdom, at least here in, in Africa, was uh, not to use PPPs where there's fast-changing technology, but maybe it's been turned on its head by now. So m maybe it's opportune for governments to make use of PPPs where we do have fast-changing technology and uh, uh, transferring the technology risk to the, to the private sector. So I do not have the final answer, and I suppose it will be project by project <laughs> that will indicate what is best. But maybe just one or two quick examples. Uh, we had a major municipality, Johannesburg municipality, that developed a broadband uh, PPP. But within three, four, five years, uh, um, uh, the, the, the market was completely overtaken by private sector parties delivering those same, that same services at much lower costs. Uh, but then again, you would find, an, I think it's an island where they are currently developing major, major uh, similar broadband PPPs. So to just leave it there that um, traditionally, to my mind at least, uh, not to use PPPs for fast changing technology, but I think it's been turned on its head and it is actually an opportunity for to transfer those risks to, to the private sector. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you very much indeed, Andre. Some good, some good thinking there. And I guess that, you know, each of us can find examples in, in our own experience of, um, you know, where uh, innovation, emerging technology and so on has become mainstream in very, very short periods of time, often actually outpacing um, the length of time it takes to get from vision all the way through to uh, procurement and contract awards. So it is a very, very fast moving environment, you know, that we're working in. Um, so look, thank you very much indeed, um, everybody. Thank you, Richard, for, you know, taking us through that, you know, particular focus topic for today. So I'm just going to ask now uh, the panel to give us their kind of closing thoughts. Um, so Richard, uh, briefly, if you could do, please. Yes, I think uh, what's come through strongly in the um, questions today is that there's a lot of interest about 
PPPs. Um, and there's a lot of devil in the detail. Um, but what we can see is that from looking at a range of international experience, we can pick up things that we might be surprised uh, coming from um, perhaps countries we, we might not expect to learn from, but have very good lessons for us. Uh, so I would certainly encourage everyone, whenever you are dealing with a challenging PPP issue, to reach out and look around the world at what um, possible um, sources of information, what contacts you have, who can uh, help and you can learn from. Um, there's a lot of experience out there and if we make use of that global experience and we do focus on what are going to be the good service outcomes for our communities and citizens, then that's really going to deliver great outcomes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. Andre and then Abaya. Thanks, Nick. So I, I just want to take us back to the, the concept of value for money. Uh, and the theory at least states that we should chase value for money in PPPs meaning we want to apply government uh, or tax money as best as possible as, as, as government employees, uh, if you look at it from that, from that angle. So, so what it means to me is that uh, the, the service-led focus, that it's, it, it's not only about the, the, the numbers, uh, the number crunching, the, the public sector comparator results, it's also about the, 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 the soft issues, uh, the, 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 the qualitative issues that, that we should focus on. Um, so I think it, it, this whole discussion actually, to my mind, uh, focus us back to value for money, but then on qualitative factors. Thank you very much indeed. Tobias? I think three things. First thing is to have successful PPPs. I think a clear pipeline and consistency in approach from government is something which is needed. Um, and I'm saying this in some context. And uh, third thing is that we need to create success stories from time to time uh, so that they become the role model. But more important thing is in the fast changing technological situation, I mean, just, I think Andrew mentioned that was very interesting case. I think we should think about creating because we need to encourage private sector to come and continuously evolve technology also rather than be married to a technology which is not evolving. Create some kind of boost structure in PPP, which is right now not considered as a PPP, where government invests or creates suitable environment for private sector to come, create space, and continuously evolve. Okay, thank you very much, Jan Venom. Well, what I think is really important is to realize that there's no one size fits all. Every PPP is different and based on the experience and the, the difference in frameworks and the approaches and also maturity, I think that is really something to really dive into deeper and that might be something for our next talk. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And Mark? Three thoughts from me. Firstly, uh, Grant Thornton with support from Chartered Institute Public Finance and Accountancy, SIPFA, uh, offer the CP3P. Uh, training alongside the Treasury Better Business Case training. I'll shout out both of those. I think they're very useful. Secondly, we haven't touched on it, uh, but um, net zero energy efficiency and the use of PPPs. I'm just doing a piece of work for Glasgow City Region in the run up to COP26 on their net zero ambitions and the business case and PPPs play a key role. And then to Richard's point, you know, look out and see who's done what across the world, around the world, there's some great uh, examples. And particularly in the UK, 700 PFIs, um, all listed on the Treasury website. If you search HMT PFI data, you'll see all the deals that are uh, in flight and it'll tell you the capital values and unitary charges and all the rest of it. So there's a lot of information out there around PPPs and PFIs. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Some really good and very timely, you know, thoughts there. We may well explore those a little bit further as a, as a focus topic in the future. And um, Charlotte, closing thoughts from yourself. Thank you very much um, to the panellists for such a fantastic show. We had lots of questions that are yet to be answered. And I think it's just a testament of how popular PPP is and we need to do another show. 
Yeah, it's a complex topic and one that we will be returning to um, in due course. And just on that note, I want to say on everybody's behalf, thank you so much, panel. Um, it's an amazing lineup and tapping into such a truly global um, uh, group of experts who have worked in many, many countries is a fantastic resource to be able to have. So look, if you're watching online and you want to connect with the panel, you can find out all of the information that you need about them as individuals and their organizations by visiting apmginternational.com. Just click on events and then find um, today's episode and you'll be able to click through and link up with them um, individually. Okay, very good. So look, coming up a little later on today, um, at one o'clock in the afternoon UK time, at two in Europe and eight in the morning over on the um, eastern seaboard in the US. We'll be discussing IT service management and in particular the challenges facing the modern service manager as they grapple with the maturity in the IT service industry um, and also the complexity, quite frankly, that um, the pandemic has accelerated. So uh, next Monday, we're going to move on and we'll be looking at um, uh, starting a conversation around online learning, what works well, what is leading practice in that field. And in particular, we're going to be looking at the use of virtual classrooms to be able to deliver not just um, state education, but actually adult education, virtual um, delivery of vocational courses and the like. So it's a very popular topic already, and the questions are already stacking up in Slido for that one. Later on the same day, um, we'll be returning to the world of projects and change management. And uh, specifically, it's actually all about how to prepare for interviews. Now, right now, um, it does seem that project managers, as ever, are in high demand, and particularly those who can really deliver. So what are the great questions that you should be asking if you're looking to expand your team? Or if you're on the other side of the equation, um, how do you set about answering them most effectively? So um, how to prepare for interviews is next Monday's topic in the projects and change management space. Subscribe to the show um, by using the little QR code or the link um, below in the chat, and we'll send you a personal summary of what's coming up over the next few weeks. And of course, you can volunteer as well to join us here on the panel and level up your career with APMG. So thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you on the next show. Thank you. Bye-bye now.